blessed Savior, still our refuge. Come, by the power of your Spirit. We have heard the prophetic utterances of the last century and a half from classical Pentecostals, from Charismatics, and from the third wave movement of a great and mighty outpouring. Many of the saints that have gone on before us Wigglesworth, Dr. Charles Price, Amy Semple McPherson, Father, even Gordon Lindsay before he died, Catherine Kuhlman, Violet Kitely, so many, Father, Daddy Hagen in 2003. All of them sensed something was coming beyond anything we've seen. We've had times of refreshing. Blessed Savior, let there come times of restoration. Re press the reset button in these days that this generation might see an expression of the fullness of your glory in the body, in the earth. Let it blanket the nations and let the spirit of prophecy be released in such a way that Christ in us, the hope of glory, would break out of every pore of our being even as he was transfigured from the inside out on that glorious mount where Peter, James, and John were caught up. Let that happen to the church in the days that lie. Give us faith, O oh God, for a radical transformation that there might be a fresh awareness of a groaning in the earth, a groaning in the spirit, and a groaning within ourselves for the manifestation of the church, the sons and daughters of God, in the glory you intend for us to partake of. Come, Lord Jesus, in the church. Come in the saints. By the power of your spirit, glorify your name. Glorify your name. We bless you, Father. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Look with me in Ezekiel chapter 37 as I continue on the theme, the voice of the prophets, the voice for the voiceless. The voice of the prophets, the voice for the voiceless. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and placed me in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. He made me walk all around them. I realized there were a great many bones in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I said to him, sovereign Lord, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and tell them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. Look, I am about to infuse breath into you and you will live. I will put tendons on you and muscles over you and will cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now notice they won't know until they live. They will not know until the process is complete and they stand on their feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. There was a sound when I prophesied. I heard a rattling and bones came together, bone to bone, or bone to its bone. As I watched, 
I saw the tendons on them, then muscles appeared, and skin covered over them from above, for there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, to the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these corpses so that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and the breath came into them. They lived and stood on their feet. An extremely great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are all the house of Israel. Look, they are saying our bones are dry, our hope has perished, and we are cut off. Literally, we are cut off from ourselves, cut off from our parts. So they're saying our bones are dry, our hope is perished, we are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am about to open your graves and will raise you from your graves, my people. I will bring you to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people. I will place my breath in you and you will live. I will give you rest in your own land then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will act, declares the Lord. When we talk, as I said yesterday, about bones in the Scripture, bones always speak of destiny waiting to be fulfilled. Bones also speak of promises that will not be denied. So that every time you see bones in the scripture, metaphorically, they are speaking of destiny and promise. Destiny and promise. Not only that, bones are supposed to stay connected. When you see the story of the redemption of Israel from Egypt. Joseph prophesies 400 years prior to their exodus and says, the Lord has shown me he's going to take you up. Notice Israel is down, the promised land is up. This is an ascending order. Don't ever simply dismiss the words up and down in Scripture because they're really important. They're really important. The whole Gospel of John, the key to the entire Gospel of John is the two prefixes, ana and kata, ascending and descending, up and down. And all the words that are important in John's Gospel have a prefix, ana and kata, and they're all tied to ascending and descending. And so Joseph says, the Lord will surely bring you up from here. Swear to me that you'll take my bones with you. Even though they've been reconciled, even though they've worked through their unfinished business as a family, there's still lingering wonderings in Joseph about whether they will keep their word. That's how hurt he was. He had to work through that, but there was still some lingering concern. He said, swear to me. And they swore to him. And on the night of the Passover, when that Passover lamb was for each household sacrifice and the lintels of the doorpost were sprinkled with blood and the Israelites came out from under the threshold of those doors from under the blood and they marched out an exceeding great army. At the front of that line wasn't just Moses and Aaron. There were four men carrying a sarcophagus, a coffin from Egypt with a man whose bones had been preserved because he had been embalmed in Egypt. The bones of Joseph went ahead of them because destiny and promise cannot be broken. If God said it, Brother Shambach said, he will do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. God is a good God. And there are things we carry in us that are like bones that remind us that no matter what we go through, if God said it, 
he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. And our heavenly Joseph tells us today, take my bones with you. Elisha's bones, when a dead man that's anonymous touched those bones, he comes back to life. And he's raised up and stands up in resurrection life as a hope of a greater resurrection. And God gives a dead man a voice through a dead prophet whose bones raise him up. The marvelous thing about the story of Elisha is that even though his flesh had rotted away within one to three years, he was buried in an open, common grave. No fanfare. God purposely allowed him to be buried in an open grave because God knew in short order someone was going to die before their time and the marauding bands of the Moabites were going to come and when his friends tossed him in there to save their own necks, God was going to raise a man up who never fulfilled his destiny and who didn't have a voice. And when he touched the bones that were intact, because it was a skeleton, everything was connected, bone to its bone. So that when that man laid on top of a framework of connectivity and networking, he took the form of what he laid on and there was enough life in those bones to raise him back to fulfill his destiny and his promise. Fast forward to the exile. And there is a company of people that, while untold thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews are taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon, only a remnant will sit by an irrigation canal. There were no rivers in Babylon. So when you read in Ezekiel or you read in the Psalms, by the rivers or the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept. Please understand, even in Psalm 1 where it says, he or she shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. This, is, this Psalm was composed in Babylon and that word planted is actually transplanted. World of difference. And there are no rivers in Babylon. It's all desert. If you remember the Gulf War, Baghdad, that's Babylon. There's no water there. So how did Babylon have all these glorious hanging gardens? They had to pipe in through an aqueduct system and a very, a very sophisticated system of irrigation canals, water from the mountains of Zion. So that the exiles are sitting by an irrigation canal that is called the River Chabar, but it's not a river, it's an irrigation canal. And most of the Israelites were accommodating to Babylonian culture and got lost in Babylon and liked it because they were already compromised. But there was a remnant that sat by this irrigation canal called Chabar. And they were transplanted trees. They got uprooted from their homeland and they were exiled. But God had allowed Babylon to create a complex water system to deliver water from Zion all the way to their captivity and plant them, transplant them by those rivers so that even though they had no temple, had no priesthood, had no way to worship God, they could still put their hands in the water seven times a day and lift them up with holy hands without wrath and dadding to pray because when they had nothing else, they could still pray and worship Yahweh, but they needed clean hands and a pure heart. And so they stayed by the river so their prayers would constantly be bathed by having their hands in the river. And so it says Ezekiel was sitting with the exiles by the river Chabar. How many of you want to be a prophet? How many of you love the prophetic? You got to sit where the exiles sit before you earn the right to prophesy. 
You've got to feel what they feel. You've got to identify with their disenfranchisement, with their dislocation, with their disillusionment, with their disorientation, and you've got to sit there and feel their pain because you can't prophesy if you've never been through anything. You can go through a course and learn how to operate in the gifts, but if you want God to turn you into a prophetic instrument, you want to go sit where the disenfranchised are and the marginalized are and feel their sufferings and feel their pain and fellowship with them. And when they put their hands in the river, you put your hands in the river and learn how to pray with them. Are you breathing? There is something about the fellowship of his sufferings that leads to the power of his resurrection. I feel like Lou Engel right about now. Just <laughs> I feel him in here. <laughs> it may be Lou's spirit, but it's the Holy Ghost. I just feel him in here. Ezekiel was by the exile, sitting where they sat, identifying fully with their pain. And it's about his 30th birthday. And you've got to remember, he's been trained to be a priest. Been trained to be a priest. What do you do when you've spent your whole life as part of the Aaronic priesthood and you're trained to be a priest and now the temple is destroyed, your future is destroyed, and everything you were trained for, there's no purpose for your life. All you do is sit there and wonder, what do I do now? I guess you just keep your hands in the river so you can lift them up and pray with a lot of water on them. So you learn how to worship. Because wisdom is not about getting explanations. Wisdom is about living with questions. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which means you've got to be able to understand he's ineffable and beyond finding out. If you want wisdom, you've got to start with the fact that you can't find him out. He's going to let you live with questions, and all you can do is just worship. All you can do is worship. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. And so he keeps his hands in the water and his heart poised towards God. And one day in his 30th year, when it should have been the high priest setting him aside like we had the ordination last night in the installation, there should have been a ceremony in Jerusalem. But God wants Ezekiel to know I may have trained you to be a priest, but your training doesn't determine your office. It simply is the preparation for what I want you to do because I have permission to train you in one thing only to release you in another. See, there are some things you're being trained in right now that you think you're going to end up where you're being trained. And the training is simply to get you ready. So don't have your daytimer. Well, you don't have daytimers anymore. That's, I'm dating myself now. Your strategic plans will go nowhere. Because strategic plans are yesterday's news. You know, there were ten versions. Five were wise and five were foolish. And the five foolish ones were strategic planners. The Lord's not coming for a while. They had planned when he was going to come as if they were in charge. But the other ones were scenario developers. They envisioned all possible situations and were ready for any situations because they were flexible and adaptable. So when the midnight cry came, the Lord comes. The five that were strategic planners were excluded and the five that were ready for any event had their lamps filled with oil and they went in and the bridegroom brought them into the inner chambers and they were ready for the consummation of the kingdom. Can I keep going? So there's this moment in his 30th year. And by the way, if you read Ezekiel 1, there are, it's a specific month in a specific year at a specific day. You want to know why? Because if you really want to be used by God, you've got to be rooted and grounded in time and space. God is a God of history. I'm going to say something that may sound deep, but you need to hear it. God isn't simply beyond time. God is in time. God experiences history with us. The incarnation didn't merely happen in time. The incarnation happened to time. 
And for those of you that sing those old Salvation Army songs and take your theology from them, please understand that in heaven there, there is time because in Revelation there is a space of 30 minutes, which means time is still measured even the eternal dimension because time is contained within the eternal. And some of us want to escape time and God does everything in time. And our problem is we think there's not enough time. And God says, I want you to redeem the time. Which means you got to be in time and be rooted in history. Which is why you got to identify with where God is. And God's never in the center where everybody wants him to be. Whenever God shows up, he always shows up in the margins. Isn't it interesting when God decided to move at the turn of the century, he did it through an African slave that was rejected and was marginalized in a ghetto in Los Angeles. And he was despised and cursed. But Jesus never starts in the center of a major denomination. He starts where nobody wants to be, where the exiles are. And he goes and sits by the river and allows them to become rooted in history. And they fellowship with his sufferings and then glory breaks out. I'm going to send Lou a tithe. I never rock. There's enough people in this room that know me. I never do this. And I, I, I really think the Italian is supposed to show up tonight, but I have no idea. But I'm just letting you know something in me is aware of something. So, rooted in history, in his 30th birthday, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a storm cloud appears coming from the north. Looks like any other cumulus cloud that's building up to a thunderstorm. Normal, natural weather pattern in the days of Babylon when Ezekiel was there, even to this day. Normal weather pattern, thunderstorm in the spring of the year. But the closer the thunderstorm gets, there are colors coming out of the clouds. Lapis lazuli, blues, electric blues. And there's fire in the midst of it, and the closer it gets, the fire isn't simply a fire. It is a company of innumerable beings that are fire in themselves. And when the storm gets close enough, it envelops him in the tornadic winds, and he's caught up by that tornado, and all of a sudden he's lifted up. And there he sees these creatures with six wings and four faces and wheels going both ways and are sitting on top of them. They become a living throne and above them there is one like a son of man. And it says the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel. FedEx, <laughs> priority delivery. But here's our problem as Americans. The evangelicals have robbed us of how to let the text be true to itself. We don't trust the story. Look at somebody and say, he's about to stretch you. Look at somebody and say, the spirit, capital S, spirit, capital of, prophecy of prophecy is here. Is here. And the spirit, of prophecy the spirit of prophecy wants to reveal, wants to reveal the, testimony the testimony of Jesus himself. Jesus. Put your seatbelt on because you're about to feel like Mary at the tomb when she says, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where I, they've laid him. I'm about to shatter your expectations about what just you heard and what you've read. It says the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the prophet, the son of Buzi. Doesn't it? 
And so you think that all of a sudden this message came. But please understand, John 1.1 says, in the beginning was the... This is not some utterance that comes by the lips of fallen humanity. This is the very utterance of the Father. Because when Ezekiel is caught up, the Word himself, who is both Word and image... He is both the word of the Father and the image of the Father. And you could not be a prophet under the old covenant unless you'd been caught up in the covenant in in the council room and you had seen the word who is the image and the image who is the word. And he personally called you to be his representative. So the word himself, Ezekiel saw the pre-incarnate son of God and got a personal invitation to abandon the idea that he was a priest and because he sat with the marginalized he was now going to become a prophet of the resurrection because nothing can stay dead in the presence of resurrection life And he's caught up into the heavenly council, which is the requirement for anyone in the Old Testament to be a prophet. Jeremiah 23, 18. Who has stood in the council? C-O-U-N-C-I-L. Not S-E-L. You go to a therapist for counsel, S-E-L. But when you go to the UN Security Council, you are brought into a company. And Jeremiah 23, 18 gives us the qualifications for a true prophet because there were men and women in Jeremiah's day, in Ezekiel's day, that could claim by self-inducement that they got a revelation. But they had never had an encounter with the one who calls. You can't induce the prophetic. It comes by an encounter with the one who is the testimony himself, the witness of the Father, who by the Spirit emblazons and engraves and imprints himself on your psyche and on your deep inner being. When John the Baptist is preaching in the first chapter of John, he says, behold the Lamb, not once but twice. But the first time when he says it, he says it after he has said, there stands one among you whom you do not know. He can feel him in the crowd, but he doesn't recognize him. Well, John, how can you feel him? He said, well, when I was in utero, I had an encounter. Because the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. And when Mary came in that room, the Son of God inside her released the Spirit from the Father. And I danced for the first time. I may be a Baptist, but I was born a Pentecostal. You can't move in God until the Spirit breathes into you the breath of life. We can't do this by rational decree. We need the Holy Spirit. We need, I'm going to get Pentecostal, we need the Holy Ghost. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit says the Lord of the host. We need the Holy Ghost. Come on. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Fill in the blanks between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And after that declaration, Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tested by the powers of darkness, by Satan himself. And he comes back after 40 days to Galilee. John is still baptizing. Andrew (laughs) and John the Beloved are standing next to John the Baptist because they're his disciples. And here comes Jesus. 
And it says Jesus was passing by. Watch this. Here's John the Baptist. Here is Andrew. Here's John the Beloved. And Jesus coming out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit is walking past John's ministry. He's walking past John. And as he walks past John, John the Baptist humbly and graciously says to Andrew and to John the Beloved, Behold the Lamb. The word for behold, the first time he declares it in public, is different in the Greek than the word for behold when he says it to the two disciples. The first one is get the vision. The second one, because there are four Greek words John uses for behold in his gospel. This word literally means, and he says privately to the two of them, let him impress himself and imprint himself on the depths of your being. And when John says that to them, they start following the one who is imprinting them to himself because he's the word and he's the image and he is impressing himself on them because you can't be made in the image and likeness of someone you can't see and hear. And they start following him. He's got eyes behind his head. He doesn't turn around. He gets far enough away from John. And then all of a sudden, like a parent that knows the kids are following, <laughs> turns around and says, what do you seek? And the word is the tail. What are you really hungry for? What do you desire? What is your passion? What is making you burn with fire? Why are you in this pursuit? What are you looking for? And they said, Rabbi. Which means they want to be taught. And they said, where are you staying? And thank God he didn't give them a street address or we'd have built a shrine. What he gave them was an invitation to a journey. Come and see. And in the Greek, it's come and keep on coming and see and keep on seeing. Are you breathing? Come and keep on coming. See and keep on seeing. So when Ezekiel is caught up and he sees one like the Son of Man, the human one, is what Son of Man really means. The real human one that Daniel prophesied about, that he saw in Daniel 7 in the council, that Zechariah saw in chapter 3 when he was invited into the council. These were the prophets because they had seen him. Abraham was a prophet because it says, he rejoiced in order to see my day, Jesus said, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham left 2,000 deities to follow the God of glory. But you don't quite get that in Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. All you get is the word of the Lord came to Abram. And you read it as he must have got some message. I want you to know the word came to him. Because, which is why when Stephen in Acts chapter 7 gives his defense, he says, men and brethren, hear these words. The God of glory appeared to Abram, our father, in Ur of the Chaldees. Well, the only way you can see the glory of God is in the face of Christ. Abram saw the word and the image, and he called him out of every false god because he is the glory of God. And he said, show me where your city is. I'm going to follow you till we get to your city because I'm leaving 2,000 false gods because you are the one I want to follow. The word and the image. The word and the image. And so, there's this catching up. And it says, the hand of the Lord came upon me, it says in Ezekiel 1. Some translations say the hand of the Lord came upon Ezekiel, but it's a mistake because in the Septuagint, it's personal. The the hand and the spirit of the Lord came upon me. Do you know that Irenaeus and Gregory of Nazianzus said the hand of the Lord is the incarnate son and the pre-incarnate son. So when it says the hand of the Lord came on, you see, how many of you know God is spirit? He doesn't have hands. Christ is the hand of the Father. So when it says 
the hand of the Lord came upon him. You could easily say, Paul says, I want to apprehend the one who apprehend, the one that laid hold of me. I want to lay hold of him. The hand of the Lord is the second person of the Godhead who appreh- You wouldn't be here tonight unless he laid hold of you. You weren't seeking him. He was seeking you. You were running from him. And you finally gave up. And you had to say uncle before you said father. You don't get any credit for your salvation because you can't save yourself. He saved you in spite of you. He laid hold of you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And appointed you to go and bear much fruit and that your fruit would remain. Aren't you glad he chose you? Aren't you glad he knew you before you knew yourself? Aren't you glad in spite of the brokenness that exists even with your beauty, he loves you past your fallibility because the infallible one inspires you in spite of your mess and turns every mess you have into a message of his goodness. And so... This hand of the Lord becomes the way, this word coming to Ezekiel becomes this way of communion that Ezekiel enters into a prophetic call that transcends his priestly preparation. 